moment. But it's good to see everyone. Happy early Purim. It's hard to believe Purim is tonight. It seems so early. I can't remember the last time Purim was in February. It's been a long time. <laughs> so uh, we'll start tonight at 630 and if you can come or watch online. Love to, to have you all with us. And if you haven't signed up for the Purim drive-in pro drive-through program tomorrow afternoon at four, it's going to be a great program. Jennifer Rosenzweig and her team have done a, just an astounding job. We have, I think, almost 200 people now coming. So it should be really, really nice. And it's a great way to celebrate Purim safely and see everybody. So we'd love to see you there at four tomorrow. And I'll let y'all know too, we are now, um, you're going to be one of the first people to know this, but now our Friday night service is open every week, whether we have a bar mitzvah or not. So you just have to register online. So to wear a mask, uh, but we'd love to see you. And starting this Friday night, we have limited, limited attendance, but it's going to increase as the weeks go by. And uh, if you want to come Friday night, just sign up online. If, and um, if you have any questions how to sign up, just let me know or Jennifer Rosenzweig know. And uh, we'd love to get you signed up. We'd love to see you. It should be great. And I hope everyone, most people, you guys getting the vaccine? Good. 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 Well, God willing, as it gets better and better in the months ahead, God willing, we'll be out of this. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Which will be really nice. Well, I appreciate everyone spending a little time with us. Um, I'll let, I, have, I see one more, preserved, one more person coming in and then, so I'll let them come in. Sarah, I see your name and, and Natalia and Marge and Vivian, welcome. And it's good to have you guys here. Oh, we have Joan Lupilov coming. So let me let her, let her enter the Zoom. Joan. Lori, I see your name. It's welcome. So let me go and start by saying um, we have so many incredible people in our congregation just do incredible work in the community in so many capacities. And one of those people is my friend Maniza Mirza Gruber. I should say Dr. Maniza Mirza Gruber. I've known Maniza for many, many years uh, through her children, her two wonderful children that are now young adults, one living in Austin, one attending um, Tulane University in New Orleans. Uh, Maniza and I have spent many high holidays together in the family high holiday service. And not only is Maniza a dedicated Beth Yashir member, but she also does some incredible work for helping people in the community. So I'm gonna let her tell you a little bit about what she does and give us all some advice that I think we all need more than ever before. So Maniza, it's a pleasure to have you with us and, and welcome. Thank you, Rabbi Strauss. It is lovely to be here. I really feel like I'm back at congregation. I'm seeing such familiar faces and it really is lovely to see you all. I know it's been a difficult year, challenging for sure. So I hope I'm able to share a few nuggets that have seen me through, which is essentially what I wanted to do. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you for just a minute. Check your volume. It's a little hard to hear you. All right, let me let me let me go. Um, hold on. I want to make sure everyone can hear you. All right. Give me a second. Is this any better? Is yeah, that I think that's better. Okay. All right. And I'll ask everyone else. I think everyone else is muted. Uh, but go ahead and have on mute. Okay. Let me know if uh, if this is also better. I'll just speak up. All right. So. Please, I mean, just raise your hand if you're not hearing me as well, and I will speak up. So I'm Manise, and um, I am a psychiatrist in Houston. I have a part-time <clears throat> private practice that's very holistically inclined, very integrative mind, body, spirit. And I also work in community mental health, where I provide 
psychiatric emergency services to the indigent and the homeless. I work with the Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD. So I'm a crisis psychiatrist there. And I also, as uh, I think Rabbi Strauss, you and I can resonate here with yoga. I'm a certified yoga teacher and I also am a certified facilitator for mind-body medicine skills. So I incorporate a lot of this work into my daily life, which I call my practice. My private practice is called Mindful in Practice because I live my life that way, um, mindfully, uh, every moment, one moment at a time. Yes, Rabbi. Sorry, Manisa. Um, I think there's some kind of background, like a white noise. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I it's all right. It's no one. I think when you I... went and turned up your volume, there was some white noise. So turn down my volume. Maybe that's what did it. Let's see. All right. Let's try again. And we will see. Uh, I'm doing what I usually do. So is this any better? Darn it. I still hear that white noise. Is everyone else okay, or can I, t I? I tested down. I tested with Nelson before we started, and I wasn't. It wasn't. Oh, weird! It only started when I said you weren't loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> you want to disconnect and then come back on? I'll let you right back on. Sure, I can do that. Let okay. Me... Hopefully, it'll be better because I want to make sure everyone can hear you clearly. Okay, sounds good. Okay, I'll let you right back. Yeah, it was definitely Menezes. All right, we'll get this worked out. I apologize, everyone. We'll get this worked out. I hope everyone's recovered from last week. It was uh, quite a week. It's good to have the power again. Okay, here comes Menezes. How are we now? Ah, still there. Still there. Can we be mindful of it and still keep going? <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's technology, Rabbi. You can't fight it. Just let her go on. She's wonderful. I agree. Oh, I agree. Whoever said that, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Manisa. Go ahead. I, I, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's for a moment, because... I, you know, this is just part of the work I do, that when something like this sort of is bothersome, I would tell someone, including myself, just honor it. Honor the fact that you are being bothered right now, in this moment, with white noise. And it's white noise which surrounds us. So we will take a nice cleansing breath so breathe with me let's just do that which is my go-to thing we're just going to take a slow deep inhale in through your nose and a long deep exhale out through your mouth just whoosh it out whooshing out that white noise we're going to take two more slow deep inhale in through your nose and a long, deep exhale out through your mouth. And this last one, slow, deep inhale in through your nose. And the longest sigh out. Okay. Now we'll begin. White noise and all. Okay. All right. So really when I asked Rabbi if I could be part of this was mainly because I wanted to share some um, some lessons I've learned. And what I would like to do, as Rabbi had said, is that, you know, I'll share and then let's just open this to questions and answers because I really like it to be interactive and I that's how I live this world. You know, I am very mindful, I, I like meeting people and I like to interact and I like to share my experiences with other people's experiences because I think the most important thing that I have learned is that as 
a human, we all need to be heard. It is the most important thing that matters to me. But we have to hear and listen with our ears and with our eyes. But most of all, we have to listen with our heart. We have to be present. We have to be in this space together, listening from here, from your heart space. And for me, that's really important because as a psychiatrist, where we're trained here, I think I go rogue. And I don't separate mind and body and neck up and neck down. So for me, the way I am present in this world is from here, from my heart space. And I connect that way. Uh, but one of the things that I think has been a pivotal it's interesting, on, after my run this morning, uh, because I have a daily practice of run, run walking, yoga and meditation, and I wake up with the meditation, I sleep with the meditation, but I met my neighbor, and Rabbi, she was even just saying, oh my gosh, is it May that Ari is graduating? And she said, wow, these four years have gone by so quickly. And it struck me that Yes, they have, but it took me back even months before Harvey, because I always thought it was Harvey that was the pivot. But for me, I realized this morning that this last four years, actually literally from February of 2017 to now, have been the changing lives, for me, the changing years in my life. I never even thought about that, that how I have changed as an individual. And I think I will quote this from Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which then became my way of living in this world. And from his book, and I have the oldest torn up version, I've literally scotch taped it, uh, where he said, suffering ceases to be suffering in some way at the moment it finds a meaning. And for me, that has been a guiding light. Because the moment I found meaning in my suffering, I realized my purpose. And it took a moment, and I make it teary eyed when I even remember it, where I actually, a couple of years ago, when my husband was very, very ill, and I was alone at home, living by myself, and my father had just died, and my dog had just died, and Harvey had happened, and all of this, and I got down on my knees, and I put my head down on this kitchen floor in child's pose. Rabbi, you know what I'm talking about, but extended child, child pose, almost like what you do at the high holiday on the bima. And I lay like that, sobbing, because I didn't know what to do. For the first time, I could say Manise did not know what to do. And I just lay there, crying. And I just said to myself, and I said to the highest power of life, just guide me to show me the way and I will do it. And that was the moment I realized my purpose. That was the moment I realized why I had left Pakistan, come to the United States, got divorced, met Nelson, married Nelson, converted to Judaism, and my purpose in life. It was the strangest phenomena that has ever happened but I realized that through my suffering, through my pain, through the realization that there is meaning in what I have to do, I can find a way to make a difference in this world. And the realization that each one of us is going to have suffering. Each one of us is going to find is going to experience pain. There's going to be some trauma. There's going to be some difficulty. But I think what I realized and what I eat and breathe now is the joy. 
I find the moments, the fullness in the great of the grateful. Gratitude for me has become the most important aspect. I, I, I remind myself, I call it pause for the positives. So at the end of every day, I, besides putting things in a gratitude jar, I literally close my eyes and I pause. And I remember everything good from that day, including my husband making a cup of tea for me at the end of the work day, every day. I remember everything that is good. Doesn't mean I don't remember the things that didn't happen. So the power went out, yes, it was hard, but I could read in candlelight and I read it in candlelight after years, and I loved it. It reminded me of being back home in Pakistan, studying for medical school, um, making tea the old fashioned way on the stove, making real chai. I mean, I just try to just, that's how I live my life. I embrace what is difficult. I don't ignore it. I don't forget about it. I notice it. I observe it. I make space for it. So what I do is I literally create this sea of awareness where they say in mindfulness and in a lot of Buddhist teachings that you, know, you have the ocean wave, but then you have the ocean. The wave is just one wave in the ocean. That's your difficult moment going to crest, it's going to fall, and that wave's going to reach the beach. It's going to go away. But then you have the, the vastness of the ocean. And as John Kabat-Zinn says, you know, the waves will come, but you can learn to surf. You can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. And as the poet Rumi has said, the wound is the place where the light enters you. Very similar to what Leonard Cohen says, there is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So my way of living is noticing that. I just notice it all. I embrace it all. I teach it all. I live it all. Doesn't mean I'm happy all the time. Doesn't mean I don't get anxious. Doesn't mean I don't worry. Doesn't mean I don't fret. But my focus has now changed to joy. Just plain, simple joy. And how can I find ways to be joyful and to be present? And the way that that evolved for me was with my breath. I learned after Harvey how to breathe how to really, truly breathe. And that one breath of mine has been my anchor. And whenever I need to be anywhere other than where I shouldn't be, I just come back and I reside in my breath. And when I'm in my breath, I'm at total peace. And I had, I had the privilege and the honor of being with my father after 20 and a half years of traveling back home, to be with him, to not just when he took his last breath, but I had to be the physician to call it. I was, I'm his youngest daughter. I had not planned for that ever in my life. Would I imagine that I would have to go home Twenty and a half years later, to be in my home country, to be with my father, to pronounce him. What an honor I was given. What an honor. And so I have learned the importance of my breath. I have learned to cherish every moment. I just 
I just live my life that way. I just live my life with what's called loving kindness, with compassion, with mindfulness. And I hope in this time I'm able to just share if even by sharing this and being open to questions and answers that I can give you just a glimpse, just a teeny tiny glimpse of how wonderful life can be, no matter what. It's, it's how we live it, it's how we choose because we have the choice. We have the choice to live our best lives. And if I can in any way pave the way to help others, then that's my purpose. That's my purpose. I wake up every morning with an intention, whatever that intention is. And then at night, I remind myself of what my intention was and how much was I able to get to it. And if not, then tomorrow is another day to reach either the same intention or a different intention. I, I wake up every morning with my hands on my heart and I say a blessing of loving kindness that extends from me to the entire universe and every sentient being and I go to sleep with that. So pretty much every day all of you on this screen are receiving some sort of loving kindness coming towards you because I include everybody, trust me, I include my friends, my family, my community, everybody is getting some loving kindness coming their way. And in fact, uh, I am going to end my part of it so I can open to you all. And I know it's just very short time. There's, there are many different versions of loving kindness meditation. And I wrote my own. And there are, there are diff different way, the, uh, ways of doing it. But So I'm not beginning with the I, which is really how it begins. And then you have concentric circles. I'm just beginning with the you. And you can receive this one from me okay so it's may you be happy and healthy may you be safe and strong may you be peaceful and protected may you be kind and compassionate may you honor your strengths and accept yourself for the person you are. For you are beautiful. From my heart to yours. Denise, thank you. Uh, I love so much about what you had to say about um, finding intention and finding purpose. Would you say that having that intention every day allows you to be more grateful? And if so, how? Yes. So my intention for today was finding space to include trust in my life. Trusting was my intention today. And the reason why is that I needed to trust myself to be here, that I can share this. I needed to trust myself to have the courage to speak openly. And so I set my intention for trust and courage. And at the end of the day, and then I will carry trust and courage with me throughout today, because that's my intention. And what I do every night is at the end of the day, I think about what my intention was for that day. And then I remember the moments that I included it and I am grateful with the most utmost of gratitude that I had the ability, if even in one moment, to trust and have courage. So when I go into work in community mental health, I can't always guarantee what's going to happen. I'm you know, as a frontline worker, I'm in masks, I'm in a shield, some wear masks, some don't. I know who I'm going to come in contact with every day. I mean, I, I spent at least 25 hours a week. And, you know, when this pandemic started, I thought we, we started with <laughs> stitched cloth masks and then we moved on to the, you know, scientifically proven ones. But anyway, my intention when I go into work there is very simple, is 
I can't change the system. But if I can make a difference in one individual's life, whether it's the homeless man or woman who's brought from the street, whether it's the anxious mother or child, whether it's my co-workers, whether it's my colleagues, whoever it is, if I can do something that allows them to know that they have value, that they matter, then that's my intention, to be kind. Because everyone needs to know that they matter and that they have value. I mean, imagine living life without that. So, and then when I leave, and I get in my car, I actually thank all my higher powers for keeping me safe and for giving me the ability that no matter what, I was able to make a difference in someone's life. And then I come home, throw my clothes in the laundry, make sure I'm showered and safe, and go about my day. And the same thing when I meet people at my office, we're six feet apart, we're wearing masks. Yeah, we do what we do. It doesn't mean that I like what's going on, but yes, answer to your question is, for me setting an intention really allows me to think about everything I'm grateful for. And I really think about the fullness. I really think about fullness of of all this abundance that is surrounding me. You are here. I mean, this is abundance to me. This is just wonderful. This is abundance. Yeah, no doubt about it. It's um, it's finding that abundance and appreciating those, those parts of it. You know, I hear a lot of people saying, Rabbi, I can't wait for life to return to normal. I can't wait for normalcy. But I think it's kind of, hit me, I think recently is not talking about the pandemic per se, but there's always going to be challenges. In other words, in this day and age, and I, maybe it's always been the case, quite honestly, I don't know if there's ever such thing as normal quote, normal times, but there's personal challenges we struggle with or national challenges, weather events, whatever it may be, there are always things happening. Um, bad news um tragedies um, just turn on the local news or the national news any night of the week whether it's now or five years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years in the future so how do you allow your patients when easy to cope with the idea that there's always going to be stresses out there always things throwing us off always um things happening that we didn't expect unexpected occurrences how do you still feel grounded when in a world of so much uncertainty? I do it in many different ways. And I use myself as an example. I am not shy sharing my experiences. I think it's what makes me human and it makes me relate to people because, you know, if someone's feeling anxious, they need to know that, you know, this is not abnormal and this is, you know, so coming to your question, I think many different ways. One is quote the scientific way, which is I explain to them what is going on in their body and in their mind when they're feeling stressed. And it's a very simple way of bringing it down to, if I had more time, your biology and your physiology. So for all of you, if you want to go back to eighth, ninth or 10th grade, where you learn something known as the autonomic nervous system. All right, it all boils down to that, you know, where there's that stress response and there's a relaxation response. Your stress response is your fight flight. Your sympathetic nervous system, your relaxation response is your parasympathetic nervous system. It's the break and the pedal. So if you have your foot on the pedal, which is your fight flight response, your stress response, your foot is off the brake. If you put your foot on the brake, you engage your relaxation response and you move away from your fight flight, your stress response. And the one easiest, simplest way to get to your relaxation response is through your breath. The simple, what's called that diaphragmatic breath rabbi that you know from yoga, 
That belly breath is what engages you to shut off your stress response. It's the antidote to that because what happens when you're feeling stressed and when stress comes, challenging situations, that part of your brain, that old part of your brain, your limbic brain hijacks everything else. So I explain this to them. This is what's happening physiologically so that they don't think that I quote either going crazy or that they are not normal because it's happening to all of us. It's what happens when you get the flutters even before you're about to speak, public speaking, going to the dentist, you know, all of the above. So I explain that to them and then I sit with them and I have them experience what they are feeling, not from here, but in their body what the experience is in the body and in their heart and we move from there and then i teach them breath work i i inform them or i share with them that you don't put any of those experiences under the carpet you know when we push towards something or we pull towards something we're in it we're in a fight we can we just allow every experience challenging joyful belongs and can we just sit there and can we notice and observe everything that is coming up and then mindfully work with it of course this medications and all that other stuff that's part of what you know my what i do what i've been trained to do but I really engage people in trying to understand what's happening in their body, noticing it, and then recognizing it and allowing for it. And then we go deeper into all the other aspects of the experience. And then the one thing that I, we always end with is self-compassion. So compassion is one thing. We have it. Is it so easy to give? It's just like forgiveness. It's like you can forgive someone else or be compassionate towards someone else. Oh, my gosh, really? And what about self-compassion? What about self-forgiveness? What about kindness here? Back, back to the self. And I engage with people in teaching them how they can learn to be kinder to themselves because if you can't love yourself you can't love anyone else if you can't show yourself compassion it's much harder to show someone else compassion so we do something very simple like i've been doing this since harvey i put my hand and this is a technique of self-compassion you put your i put my hand on my heart and i call my heart darling so i just rub it and I speak to darling and I tell darling how difficult things are and how challenging they are. But we will get through it. I soothe it and I nurture it. My heart. Because that's where my soul speaks from. And this is just a very simple technique. I mean, if you all practiced it, if you're, you're just put your left hand on your heart, your right hand over your left hand. It may seem silly. Call your call heart Yoda if you want, or you know, a Bevo if you want, <laughs> and just rub it. Just see how it feels, just for a moment. If you just are kind to this beautiful heart of yours that needs you, that just needs you to show it some love and some compassion, and you can do that, and you can do that. Now that we can't hug in person, self hugs. Let's just. Hug ourselves, you know, another, I mean, I, I, this, these are some of the things I do. I, I, I operate from moving from my heart, my heart space. And then I connect what's called the mind intelligence with the body intelligence with the heart intelligence. And when you connect those three, so much easier to travel through life. The journey is much easier. No doubt about it, Meniza. I love that there are so many little and very profound ideas that you have to share with us to kind of get us through our day and get us through this time and get us through life. Really helpful. I imagine you do some great work. I know you do some great work with the people you meet with. Any questions at all or um, anything at all for Manuza? 
ask me whatever. I'm here for you. Whatever feels comfortable. Happy to answer. Hey, it's lovely to see your faces. The ones who are on video, it's just so lovely. Laurie, I just miss you and it's wonderful to see you. And Bobby, we did our the name it's a class together and Lily and you know Marge. I mean there's so many people here I I don't see, but you know, whilst you're on the screen, you know, it's wonderful to be in this space with all of you. It really, really is. Sarah, do you have a question? May I ask? Sure, of course. You kept thinking about one person. Rabbi, correct me, but somewhere in the Midrash or the Talmud, does it not say if you save one life, you save the world? That's exactly right. There's a very famous phrase in the Talmud. That's exactly right. No doubt about it. Manisa, when when do you set your intention and how do you determine what your intention is going to be for the day? I, I set it in the morning before my feet touch the ground. So when I have my hands on my heart and I begin with my loving kindness meditation, it's, it's set after that, but I never know what my intention is till I wake up in the morning. I never plan it. I never plan it. I just wait. I, I allow it to arrive. But it's always in the morning because I have to, ha for me, it's, um, <laughs> I remember one, my husband Nelson said, what is, the, you're always sleeping with your hands. I, I, I literally, I've got into this habit. I sleep, I fall off to sleep with my hands on my heart. I, I just do, that's how I resonate. You know, I have to feel it, I have to know it, I have to feel my breath, I have to hear my breath. And then I wake up like that in the morning and I, I move from there. I move from there. I, um, I have these little post-it notes. Uh, on, and in fact, I just saw it the other day. It was on December 4th. I wrote down, I am strong. That was, my, that was what I said. That was what would matter to me that morning when I woke up. I am strong. And I traveled through that day, remembering that I am and how can I continue to be strong and sort of be a source of strength for somebody else. But I never plan it. Sarah, you had a question? Um, well, actually, it's just like a statement. I remember when you were our young people speaker and you told us the story about your life. And I was thrilled today when you told us that you were able to go back to Pakistan because you had said at that Yom Kippur speech that you were never going to be able to see your father again because you had converted, you had left their religion and there was something, you know, you weren't going to be allowed back in the country or whatever, or you, or you didn't dare. So I'm just, I just want you to know that I'm thrilled that you were able to go there. Thank you, Sarah. And you know, that in itself is how I feel that the universe knew what was meant for me. Somebody out there knew. I was so full of fear. And I've been back home four times since. Oh, wow. um, right. And I still don't know what can happen when I go. I just believe in the fact that somehow my dad made it happen before he passed. He knew. I have this firm belief he knew. And it happened so suddenly because I had no intentions of, you know, it was interesting that year, 2018, when we were in, uh, throughout that year, from April onwards, I was uneasy. And I kept telling my dad, daddy, I'm coming, daddy, I'm coming. And he said, I know, I know. Um, and then that year, I remember at Yom Kippur, I was very uneasy during services. Even though I was part of the family choir, there was, when we were saying, it was the first time 
I actually stood up and when we did the community, do you want to say some of someone's name to the microphone? And I said my dad and my mom's name. I have never done that before, ever. But I did it that year. And right after that, I got a call from home to say daddy's not well. We're not sure what's wrong. And then two weeks later, I remember the date, September 24th. I got a call from my sister to say, they call me Manu. It's not looking so good. And I don't know what's wrong. And I said, I'm flying in. It was a sim I didn't even have a Pakistani visa because my Pakistani passport expired. I went Tuesday morning to the embassy here in Houston. I took out my papers Monday night. I got my visa. I went there and I spoke in Urdu. Didn't care what they Google searched, what they found out about me. And I told them my father may be dying. I need a visa. And I started to cry and he said, come back at three o'clock. And Nelson took me back at three o'clock. I was on a plane on Thursday. And I landed at the airport after 20 and a half years. And I was nervous. And I was terrified what immigration might say. And I walked up and I remember saying a prayer. And Rabbi, I called you before I, you left and you gave me the traveler's prayer. Now, I tell you, I couldn't take it in with me because it was in Hebrew, so I left it in our car. I even had to, I even took off my rings, which are in Hebrew. So I wore different wedding bands and things because I was just trying to just walk in like Pakistani Muslim. And I went to, I remember the immigration officer and, you know, he, he looked at my passport. I walked in with an American passport, Pakistani visa. And I said to him in Urdu, Salam. And I said, I'm here to see my father who I think is dying. And he looked at me and he said, what a long flight you have had. I wish you well. Yeah. That, that was my entrance into my country 20 and a half years later. And then I was there for five weeks with my family taking care of my dad. Day in and day out, 24 seven, till he passed. And I remember the day when I was only supposed to be there for one week and I realized what was going on when I took him to the hospital for an ultrasound and I realized what was going on and I didn't know how long this process was going to last and I remember him asking me, um, Minnie, how long are you here for? And I had told him initially when I arrived, I'm here for one week. And then after that ultrasound, which was two days later, I went to him and, he, and I said, Dad, I'm not leaving on the 8th. I was supposed to leave on October uh, 8th. And he said, Minnie, when are you leaving? And I said, I don't know, Daddy. I'm here to stay. I'll stay for, I don't know. And he said, what about Nelson? He's going to be alone. I said, Nelson will be fine. I'm here to stay. And my dad passed on October 25th. But I was blessed to have five weeks with him. I took care of him day and night with my sisters. And I was blessed to be with him that last breath. And then I came home. So, and I've been back since then because then my mom got ill and I flew back and I've been flying since then. I was last there because of COVID. I even went in September, she was not well. So I flew in the midst of COVID to be with her and I'll be back there, in, you know, in July again to be with her. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how, how it's been orchestrated, but life has just fallen into the space. So thank you for remembering Sarah, because yes, I did not get to make him his favorite scrambled eggs. He was not able to eat scrambled eggs. But I was able to literally be with him and I think the most meaningful thing that I was able to do was actually I was able to ask him for his forgiveness. So it was a profound experience and and I think it has changed my life. Even since the Yom Kippur speech. It's 
changed my life completely. Woman Isa, when you go again, be careful. But I know Always. You, I know you'll go with God's blessings and Always. give you a chance to spend time with your family there. Um, thank you. It was a kind of a good way to find our balance, find our compass as we get ready to celebrate Purim tonight. Get ready then for Shabbat. I'm Anisa. We look forward to having you again. And uh, only God's blessing in your, in your important work. That you do. Thank you, Rabbi. And thank you, everyone, for being here and for sharing and for listening. And really, I mean, my, I think what I just want to share, just trust yourselves. Just honor yourselves, honor your feelings, honor your space, honor your, really honor this heart of yours. It knows. It knows. It really knows. And always just stay with your breath. Next time we'll do some movement exercises and maybe we'll do some more fun stuff of, you know, where we really learn these things. But maybe that's for another time. Um, but really, thank you so much. And be well and... Yeah. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Maniza. And thank you, everyone. And uh, be safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.